You might have heard of a phenomenon called total internal reflection. Well, if you haven't, total internal reflection occurs when light falls on the boundary between two materials of different refractive indices under certain conditions. A certain condition on the incident angle is to be met for this to happen, which we will get into later. But this video is not about total internal reflection. It raises one question. Is total internal reflection really total internal reflection? To deal with this question, we introduce the concept of evanescent waves. Now before we get into evanescent waves, I'll tell you one thing. It can have a number of sources. But the only source that we'll discuss in the video is this. An incident ray of light is incident on the interface between two different media. In this ray diagram, we can say that this is the incident ray of light, this is the reflected ray of light, and this is the transmitted ray of light. Here theta are the angles with the normal. N1 is the refractive index of medium 1 and N2 is that of medium 2. And the positive x direction is parallel to the interface and on the plane of the incident ray of light. And this is the positive z direction which is normal to the surface. Let's put this diagram aside for a minute and look at this expression. It's quite familiar to us. It's the Snell's law. It relates the refractive indices of the two medium and uh, the angle made by the rays of light with the normal. On rearranging this, we get this. Theta t is sine inverse of n1 by n2 sine theta i. But there's something absurd with this relation. What if the thing inside the bracket, n1 by n2 sine theta i, what if it's greater than 1? Sine inverse cannot take arguments which are greater than 1. So, this uh, under this condition, this relation would not hold. On rearranging this, we get this sine theta i is greater than n2 by n1. The point at which this relation breaks is when sine theta i is equal to n2 by n1 and that angle is known as the critical angle and it can be written as this theta c is equal to sine inverse of n2 by n1. Now let's put this relation aside for a while. The condition under which total internal reflection occurs as we have been taught is this theta i is greater than theta c and this total internal reflection is called a total internal reflection because when light is incident on the surface it completely reflects off of it back into the medium from where it came but does it actually completely reflect off we look into that now taking these two expressions and substituting the value of theta i from the previous relation we get this sine inverse of n2 by n1 sine theta t is greater than theta c. Now putting this expression inside this, we get sine theta t is greater than 1 as the relation which is required for total internal reflection, which seems quite absurd, but sine theta t is still a real number. Now, let's go back to the ray diagram that we started off with. Some of us might have seen this expression. For those that haven't, I'll explain this e t vector equals e naught t vector multiplied by e raised to i k gamma minus omega t. Here e t is the electric field vector, e naught t is the constant electric field vector amplitude, k is the propagation coefficient and gamma is the position vector. The omega is the frequency of the light used. Now uh, on splitting this k into two of its components which is kx and kz uh, we get this expression. We are ignoring the ky term because ky is uh, coming out of this plane and this does not affect anything that is happening on this plane so we ignore it. So we get the relation e t vector equals e naught t vector times e raised to i kx times x vector plus kz times z vector minus omega t. And from this half of the uh, ray diagram we can conclude that kz is equal to kt cos theta t as it is the cost component of this propagation coefficient kt and it's along the z direction. Similarly, kx is kt sine theta t. Now, plugging these two equations into this equation, we get this. And this defines how the electric field behaves on this side of the interface. We've got uh, a constant term, e naught t vector. We've got an exponential term that does not depend on the positions. And we got two terms which depend on the positive uh, on the x direction and the z direction. Now let's look at this expression 
under the condition for total internal reflection, which we derived earlier as sin theta t is greater than 1. Now, if sin theta t is greater than 1, uh, but it still remains a real number, so it does not affect this term in any way. Since this is a constant and this does not depend on position, it does not affect these terms either. But what about this term? We know that cos theta t is root of 1 minus sine square theta t. So if sine theta t is greater than 1, it means that cos theta t is an imaginary number. Since kt is equal to n2 omega by c, where c is the speed of light and omega is the frequency, n2 is the refractive index, which are all real numbers, kt is also a real number, which means that the product of kt and cos theta t is an imaginary number. We may represent this as kt cos theta t is equal to a times i, where a is some constant. Now, taking this expression and plugging it into this expression, we end up with this. In this expression, I've separated out the regular terms and the other term. The regular term has got the amplitude, uh, a, a term that depends on the time, and a term that depends on the x vector. The term that depends on the z vector is e raised to minus az, which is not imaginary because the, this i and this i cancels out. So it gives a negative sign, which means that et is exponentially decaying. Rather, since it's a real number, e naught t times e raised to minus az will result in the amplitude, which means the amplitude of the electric field is decaying with respect to the z vector. And since we are not interested in the imaginary part of the electric field, we take the real part of it. And this real part is equal to e naught t times cos of kt sin theta t x minus omega t, the whole multiplied by e raised to minus az. So this expression shows that the electric field is uh, oscillating continuously with respect to time and position, or with respect to x, and the amplitude of this is decaying exponentially with respect to the z vector. So let's look at this pictorially. If this is the positive x direction, uh, which is along the interface, and this is the positive z direction, which is normal to the interface, this is the incident ray, and this is the reflected ray, we have an electric field like this in this direction. And because of this term, the magnitude of uh, the amplitude of this uh, electric field decays exponentially as we move uh, along the plus z direction as shown here and this decays exponentially. So this whole field that exists on the right hand side of the interface is the evanescent wave or the evanescent field. Now let's get into some properties of the evanescent wave. The evanescent wave does not propagate like a regular electromagnetic wave. Rather, its energy is concentrated spatially around the source. In this case, the source is the boundary between the two materials. To put this in other words, we can say that evanescent waves do not transfer energy from one point to another. Rather, it just carries energy within it because all waves carry a certain amount of energy. We can also say that there is no net energy flow that is, the pointing vector which gives the direction of net energy flow when uh, averaged algebraically over the region, over a complete oscillation, results in zero. So, you may ask the question, why is it necessary for evanescent waves to arise? Like, what's the physical implication? Right now, we've derived it mathematically, but what's the physical reason behind this? This comes from the Maxwell's boundary condition. The physical explanation for the existence is that electric and or magnetic fields cannot be discontinuous at a boundary, which means that when a ray of light is incident on a boundary and it reflects back, the electric field on the left of the boundary has to be equal to the electric field on the right of the boundary, which gives rise to evanescent waves. Evanescent waves have a lot of applications. They can be used as optical fiber sensors for detecting trace chemicals. When uh, a small amount of a chemical is present in a solution and this has been exposed to evanescent fields, uh, by observing the spectrum of absorption, we can see the peaks of absorption and thus detect the type of chemical and the concentration present. 
It can also be used in ultra-high resolution microscopy by observing the characteristics of evanescent waves produced at the interface between materials. And thus, very high accuracy imaging can be done using this. Now, for performing all these applications, first we need to detect evanescent waves. Now, how do we do this detection? Imagine there are two different media, say, uh, of refractive indices N1 and N2, where N1 is greater than N2. When light rays uh, arrive at the interface, they get reflected back, assuming that total internal reflection conditions hold. In this case, evanescent waves are generated over here in this direction, and these decay exponentially as we go upwards. Now, assuming it reaches the end of this interface uh, and still has a certain amplitude of electric field, and we put another medium here of the same refractive index as this, uh, surprisingly, light is generated from this point. So, light travels in this medium, does not travel in this medium, and suddenly comes out of this medium. And this gives a sort of proof for the existence of evanescent waves. And by measuring the characteristics of the resulting light beam, we can analyze the uh, distance between these. And can, we can also find the characteristics of the evanescent field in between. This phenomenon is called frustrated total internal reflection. We hope this video was informative. Thank you very much.